Welcome to the Everything History Podcast. This is episode 47, De Cesaribus, by Sextus Aurelius Victor, part 1. This is a reading from, as the title indicates, Sextus Aurelius Victor's De Cesaribus, which means concerning the emperors. Full title was likely Liber de Cesaribus, or Liber de Caesaribus, which you can take as book concerning the emperors or book on the emperors. Victor himself states the following as a preface. Quote, the abbreviated histories of Aurelius Victor, from Augustus Octavian, that is, from the end of Titus Livy to the 10th consulship of Constantius Augustus and the 3rd of Julian Caesar. End quote. Note, and please remember this, I myself, Thomas, the narrator, interrupt this at no point. So when the first person is used, that is Victor speaking. Also to be mindful of, this book is not without flaws. There are many inaccuracies and prejudices that are written as facts by Sextus Victor. They are not. Much of the information contained within De Cesaribus is flat out wrong. This is especially true for the Caesars, or emperors as we call them, that the senatorial and equestrian classes despised. Victor also occasionally speaks in a manner that contemporary individuals might find insensitive. With that, enjoy. I discharged my last duty as king and emperor. This is Everything History. We meant more to kids than Jesus did, or religion at that time. I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. Section 1. In about the 722nd year of the city, the custom commenced at Rome of obeying one man alone. For Octavian, son of Octavius, received the cognomen Caesar, after being adopted by his great-uncle, and subsequently through a decree of the nobility, that of Augustus, because he had exploited his party's victory leniently, won over the soldiers with bribes and the common people by his apparent concern for the grain supply, and subdued the rest without difficulty. When roughly forty-four years had passed in that manner, he died of an illness at Nola, having added Raetia and Illyricum to the empire of his fellow citizens and tame the fierce spirits of foreign nations except for Germany. Though he was the third after Numa to close the temple of Janus when he had defeated Antony, this would occur according to Roman law when all wars had ceased. The man possessed a charming and gracious disposition, but he had an excessively ardent passion for luxury and the games and an immoderate desire for sleep. He was a great supporter of learned men who were numerous and his friends since he was remarkably devoted to the study of eloquence and religious practices. He was called Pater Patriae, father of his country, because of his clemency, and he was granted permanent tribunician power. Consequently, temples, priests, and sacred colleges were dedicated to him as a god at Rome and in the most famous cities in all the provinces both while he was alive and after his death. He was so fortunate, except, however, for his children and also his marriage, that the Indians, Scythians, Garamantes, and Bactrians sent envoys to beg for his alliance. Section 2. Thereafter Claudius Tiberius Nero, admitted by adoption from the position of stepson to be among Augustus's children, when he realized that those circumstances which were causing alarm were safe enough, embraced the imperial power while shrewdly refusing its title. Cunning and rather secretive, he often pretended to oppose what he especially desired, and insidiously supported what he detested. His mind was far sharper in making sudden decisions. After a good beginning, he subsequently became pernicious, given to the most unnatural lust for persons of practically every age and sex, and punishing all too cruelly the innocent and the guilty. His own relatives and strangers alike. Moreover, in the period when he detested cities and assemblies, he sought out the Isle of Capri as a cover for his shameful activities. Therefore, since military affairs were neglected, a great part of the Roman Empire was ravaged, and no new provinces were formed except for Cappadocia, and that at the beginning of his reign when King Archelaus had been removed. The predatory raids of the Gaetuli, which had broken out everywhere under the leadership of Tacfarinas, were suppressed. At the same time, Maroboldus, king of the Subai, was cunningly entrapped. Furthermore, he collected from every quarter the Praetorian cohorts, which had been kept dispersed and lodged in private homes at Rome or in the nearby municipalities, and concentrated them in a camp near the city, calling the authority by which they were controlled the Praetorian Prefecture, which was an increase in status, for Augustus had instituted other bodyguards and guards as units. 
Section 3. And so Tiberius Claudius, when he had ruled for twenty-three years and was seventy-nine years old, was overcome by a fever or a plot, and Gaius Caesar, surnamed Caligula, was appointed with universal consent because of his ancestry and his father, Germanicus. For Augustus, through his daughter, was his great-grandfather, and his grandfathers were Agrippa on his mother's side and Drusus, father of Germanicus, who was his father. The common people were greatly moved by their modesty and by their untimely deaths, except for Octavians, as well as by the deaths of his mother and brothers whom Tiberius had eliminated in various ways. For this reason, everyone strove to mitigate the misfortune of such a great family with their expectations of the very young man. Then again, because he had been born in the army, where he had acquired his surname from a military boot, Caligula, he was loved and accepted by the legions. Furthermore, all the most sensible people believed that he would be like his relatives, but it turned out quite differently, as if by some law of nature which frequently, as if by design, produces bad men from good, bores from quite learned men, and others of this kind or the opposite. In fact, from his example, many intelligent men have decided that it is more beneficial not to have children. Moreover, in Caligula's case, they were not very far off from the truth inasmuch as for a long time he had so concealed the enormities of his nature by his proper behavior and pretense of obedience that it was justly said in public that there had never been better servants nor a harsher master than he. Finally, after abstaining power, as is customary with the people of such a disposition at the beginning, for several months of that year he granted extraordinary benefits to the people, the senators and the soldiers, and when a conspiracy had been reported as if he did not believe it, he declared that it could hardly have been undertaken against him whose life was a burden or detriment to no one. But suddenly, after he had killed a few innocent people through various crimes, he revealed the nature, as it were, of a wild beast that had tasted blood. And so thereafter three years passed while the world was defiled with the widespread murders of senators and nobles. Furthermore, he amused himself by debauching his sisters and mockingly marrying noblewomen, and would go about dressed like a god since he claimed that he was Jupiter on account of his incest, but also Liber because of his chorus of the Bacchants. Similarly, he concentrated his legions in one place with the exception of crossing over into Germany, then he ordered them to gather cockles on the shore of the ocean, while he himself went among them at times in the flowing robe of Venus. At other times, in full armor, he would say that he was taking spoils not from men but from gods, doubtless because he had heard that according to the Greeks, who loved to embellish everything, that fish of this kind are called nymphs' eyes. Elated by this, he had attempted to have himself addressed as lord, and to fasten royal insignia to his head. Consequently, at the instigation of Chirea, those who possessed Roman courage were impelled to deliver the state from such a terrible scourge by stabbing him to death and that outstanding exploit of Brutus when he expelled Tarquinius would have been repeated, if only the true Romans had been performing their military service. But when, through apathy, the citizens conceived the desire to draft foreigners and barbarians into the army, morals were corrupted, freedom was suppressed, and the craving for possessions increased. In the meantime, while in accordance with the decree of the Senate, armed men were hunting down the family of the Caesars, even those of the female sex, and all their relatives by marriage, by chance Vimius, a native to Ipirus, and a centurion from the cohorts, which were occupying strategic locations throughout the palace, discovered Titus Claudius concealing himself in a disgraceful hiding place, dragged him out, and exclaimed to his comrades that if they were smart, there was the emperor. And certainly because he was foolish, he seemed extremely mild to unsuspecting men. This had helped him against the wicked intentions of his uncle Tiberius and prevented him from being envied by his nephew Caligula. Moreover, he had won the hearts of the soldiers and plebs until he himself could be considered more pitiable than contemptible through the violent tyranny of his family. As most of them were recalling these facts, the crowd which was present suddenly surrounded him with no opposition and the rest of the soldiers and the great throng of ordinary people began to flock to him, Claudius. When the senators had learned this, they quickly sent to see if they could suppress the bold coup. But after the state and the people of all ranks were torn by various frightful dissensions, as if on command, they all surrendered. Thus at Rome the royal power was confirmed. And it was all too plainly revealed that men's efforts were rendered vain and futile by fortune. Section 4. Consequently Claudius, although he was a shameful slave to his stomach, 
foolish as well as forgetful, of timid disposition and rather cowardly, nevertheless, mostly because of his apprehension, made some outstanding decisions, particularly on the advice of the nobility whom he courted through fear. Simple-minded people, you see, do what their advisers tell them. In short, because of his good counselors, vices were suppressed by him, as were the notorious rights of the Druids throughout Gaul. The most beneficial laws possible were established, military matters were dealt with, frontiers for the Roman Empire were restrained or furnished. Mesopotamia in the east, the Rhine and the Danube in the north. And in the south, the Moors were added to the provinces since their kings had been removed after Juba. A band of Musulami were destroyed, and at the same time, in the lands of the extreme west, parts of Britain were subdued, which was the only place he visited, setting out by sea from Ostia for his generals had taken care of the rest. Furthermore, he relieved the grain shortage which Caligula had brought on when he had collected cargo ships from all over the world and attempted at the expense of the people to make the sea a thoroughfare for theaters and chariots. Similarly, after he had carried out a new census and had removed quite a lot from the Senate since he had restrained a dissolute young man whose father had asserted that he had approved of him, he, Claudius, had justly added that a father should also be a censor for his children. But when he had been dragged into depravity through the enticements of his wife, Messalina, and at the same time of his freedmen, to whom he had subordinated himself, not only were tyrannical acts committed, but also whatever the worst sort of women and slaves are capable of if their husband or master is a fool. For his wife, in the first place, committed adultery indiscriminately, as if it were her right, and to such an extent, the very many who refused her, whether because of their character or through fear, were killed along with their families as she, with typical womanly wiles, charged those whom she had solicited with soliciting her. Aroused to greater enormities by this, she had forced certain women from the nobility, married and unmarried, to act as prostitutes with herself, like common whores, and men were made to participate. But if anyone recoiled from such depravity, she would fabricate a charge and savagely attack him and his whole family. You see, his own household used to terrify Claudius, who was, as we have shown above, extremely timid by nature, in particular by instilling in him the fear of a conspiracy, so that by means of this machination even his freedmen would ruin whomsoever they wished. At first they connived at her crimes, but when they became as powerful as their patroness, they killed her, too, through their agents without their master's knowledge, yet as if he had given the command. And indeed, the woman had gone to such extremes that she celebrated a marriage with another man at Rome when her husband had gone to Ostia to enjoy himself with his mistresses. And she became even more notorious through this as it appeared astonishing that at the emperor's palace she had married a man other than the emperor. Thus the freedmen, after acquiring complete power, corrupted everything with their depravity, exiles, murders, and proscriptions, and so prevailed upon their master's folly that though he was an old man, he set his heart on marrying his brother's daughter. Although she was considered more irrational than her predecessor, and therefore feared a similar fate, she murdered her husband with poison. In his sixth year as emperor, although he reigned fourteen years, the 800th anniversary of the city was celebrated in magnificent style, and in Egypt the phoenix was seen, a bird which, they say, flies every 500 years from Arabia to palaces which are on the record, and in the Aegean Sea a huge island emerged one night during which a lunar eclipse had occurred. Furthermore, the death of Claudius was concealed for a long time, as had once happened in the case of Priscus Tarquinius, while the guards, corrupted by the woman's guile, pretended that he was sick and that the management of the state had been entrusted by him to his stepson, whom he had quite recently adopted. Section 5. In this manner, Lucius Domitius, for that was certainly Nero's name, since his father was Domitius, was made emperor. He, although he had reigned as many years as his stepfather while he was a very young man, nevertheless was so astounding for five years, especially in enhancing the city, that Trajan quite often justifiably asserted that all emperors fell far short of Nero in his first five years, during which he even reduced Pontus to provincial jurisdiction with the consent of Polemon, for whose sake it is called Pontus Polemoniacus. And similarly, the Cotian Alps, after King Cotius, had died. Consequently, it is reasonably certain that age is no barrier to virtue, that it is easily transformed if one's nature has been corrupted by unrestricted freedom, and that the law of adolescence, as it were, if it is omitted, recurs more destructively. 
for Nero, in fact, spent the rest of his life so disgracefully that it is disgusting and shameful to record the existence of anyone of this kind, let alone that he was the ruler of the world. He, while he had begun by singing to the Kithara in public in competition for a crown, a Greek innovation, went to such extremes that he spared neither his own nor anyone else's decency and finally, dressed in the fashion of young girls getting married, openly in the presence of the Senate, after a dowry had been given and everybody was celebrating in a festive manner, was married to someone chosen from among all his coterie of perverts. Yet this must be considered rather trivial in his case, for, in fact, while decked out in the skin of a wild beast, he would nuzzle the genitals of people of either sex who had been chained up like criminals and, in an even more disgusting act, he compelled couples to copulate. Furthermore, among these activities, many consider that he had intercourse with his mother since she too, in her passion for power, was willing to commit any crime whatsoever to subject her son to her. I personally think that this is true, although there are writers with different opinions. For, in fact, when vices have entered the mind of humans in no way feel the obligations of decency in dealing with strangers and habitual sinning, which leads to novel and therefore sweeter pleasures, finally turns them to their own families. This is demonstrated more forcefully by the following. While she, his mother, in a sort of progression went via other men to marriage with her uncle, and from the torture of strangers to the murder of her husband, he by degrees proceeded to defile a priestess of Vesta, then himself, and finally each defiled the other. Nevertheless, such delights could not unite them. But they were drawn into danger on that account, and, while they plotted against each other, the mother was forestalled and killed. Accordingly, when he had violated every law, human and divine, by parricide, and was attacking the nobility with greater and greater violence, many men plotted, naturally at different times, to liberate the state. After these had been betrayed and executed, he decided even more monstrously to destroy the city with fire. The common people with wild beasts let loose everywhere in the Senate with a similar fate, and he sought a new capital for his empire principally through the encouragement of the Parthian ambassador who happened to be at a feast. The entertainers were singing, as is the custom, when he demanded a kithara player for himself. Upon being told in response that the player was a free man, Nero had added that he should take whomsoever he wished, indicating to those who were attending the banquet that under imperial rule no one was considered free, and if Galba, who was governor of Spain, upon learning that his execution had been ordered, had not come to the rescue by seizing power, although he was of advanced age, such a great crime would without a doubt have been committed. But at his approach, Nero was deserted on all sides except by a eunuch, whom he had once tried to make into a woman by surgery, and he stabbed himself since, although for a long time he begged for someone to kill him. He had not deserved anyone's assistance even to die. This was the end of the family of the Caesars, which many portents foretold, in particular the withering on their estates of a grove of laurel dedicated to them for their triumphs, and the death of their chickens, which were so numerous and white and so suitable for religious rites that even today a place is kept for them at Rome. Section 6 but when Galba, who was no less noble than they, as a descendant of the extremely renowned family of the Sulpicii, had entered Rome, as if he had come to promote excesses or even cruelty, he pillaged, plundered, and harassed, and in every disgraceful manner he destroyed and defiled everything, becoming more detestable through these actions, for those who were expected to govern more mildly offend more grievously. And at the same time, because, in his excessive greed for money, he had reduced the pay of the soldiers, he was killed at the instigation of Otho. The latter, hurt insufferably because Galba had preferred to adopt Piso, had led angry armed cohorts into the forum. When Galba, wearing a cuirass, hurried there to quell the disturbance, he was killed near the Lacus Curtius on the seventh day and in the seventh month of his reign. Section, se Section 7 Consequently, Sauius Otho, once to his shame, a close friend of Nero, seized power, though he was hardly more than an adolescent. He ruled in a predictable manner for nearly eighty-five days, but after he had been beaten in battle at Verona by Vitellius, who had come down from Gaul, he took his own life. Section 8. Thus the power was passed to Alus Vitellius, and from such a beginning, and from such a beginning it would have become progressively more destructive if Vespasian had been detained any longer by the Jewish war which he had undertaken on the orders of Nero. 
He, when he had learned of Galba's actions and of his suppression, and also, because envoys from the Molsian and Pannonian armies had arrived among those encouraging him, seized the imperial power. For the soldiers mentioned above, after they had discovered that Otho had been made emperor by the Praetorians and Vitellius by the German legions, in rivalry, as is their custom, so that they should not seem different, urged on Vespasian, upon whom the Syrian cohorts had already agreed because of his outstanding qualities. In effect, Vespasian, a senator from a new family with ancestors from Raete, was regarded as a member of the high nobility because of his hard work and his civil and military achievements. When his legionary commanders had crossed into Italy and the Vitalian forces had been routed at Cremona, Vitellius had come to an agreement with Sabinus, the urban prefect and Vespasian's brother, with the soldiers as mediators, that he would abdicate his imperial position for a hundred million sesterces, but subsequently, after he imagined that he had been deceived by the reports with his fury compounded, so to speak, he burned Sabinus and the rest of the opposing faction together with the capital, which they had seized as a refuge for their safety. But when it was revealed that the reports were true and that his enemies were approaching, he was led out of a porter's hut where he had hidden himself, a noose was tied around his neck as they do with parasites, and he was dragged to the Gamonian steps and thrown down them. And at the same time his body was stabbed with as many blows as each man could inflict, and it was thrown down into the Tiber in the eighth month of his tyranny when he was more than fifty-seven years old. All these whom I have briefly touched upon, and particularly the family of the Caesars, were so refined in literature and eloquence that, had they not been excessive in all their vices with the exception of Augustus, their great talents would surely have cloaked ordinary misdemeanors. Although through these instances it is generally agreed that character is of paramount importance, nevertheless, all good men, and especially a supreme ruler, need both qualities equally if it is possible otherwise if the purpose of life should take a giant step backwards at least let him assume the dignity of refinement and learning end of section eight remember that you can contact me on the podcast facebook page or at the email address everything history podcast at gmail dot com thank you very much <laughs> <laughs>